Hey everybody, it's time for another Principles of Writing video series with yours truly, me. A while back, we did a character growth case study series, and I mentioned in the introduction how character growth and character development are terms often used synonymously when they're not technically the same thing. And I said I'd eventually make a video delving into that topic, so... Here we are. As usual, first I will begin by defining the term, and then we'll get into a case study of examples from popular media in a second video. Let's get started. Admittedly, in the writing industry at large, many consider development to include a character's evolution over the course of the story, their character arc, be it growth or decay. Which is to say that development is not always growth, even though growth falls under the umbrella of development. Kind of like how a square is always a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. Ultimately, I find that separating the two terms allows for deeper analysis and discussion of each. So for the sake of this video, we're going to treat them as two totally different things. I explain what character growth is and how to do it properly in the other case study series, but I'll do a quick recap here for those who may have not seen that yet. Character growth is another term used specifically for positive character arcs, when the behavior of a character changes positively over the course of a story as a result of their experiences. There is a distinct change in either their values, interests, beliefs, allegiances, or personalities between the beginning of the story to the end, shown clearly to the audience through a lasting change in their behavior. And in negative character arcs, the change is referred to as character decay. It doesn't matter if it happens slow and subtle or sudden and obvious, but in order for a character to have proper growth, we, the audience, need to see their behavior change as a result of relevant experiences we witness them go through, including meaningful consequences they receive when they falter or regress. It's pretty straightforward. Growth takes the character from point A to point B, typically resolving character flaws, freeing them from a lie they believed, improving their skills, etc. Character development, on the other hand, is a term used to describe two processes that a writer undertakes when creating a story, which both result in the same achievement, a well-rounded character. First is the process of character creation, when a writer takes a character idea and develops it into a three-dimensional person, figuring out, in no particular order, their appearance, abilities, motivations, desires, fears, strengths, weaknesses, beliefs, personality, relationships, backstory, etc, etc, etc. Second is the process of relaying the necessary amount of that information to the audience at appropriate times over the course of the story. The writer needs to figure out what is important for the audience to know, when is the best time to inform them, and how to present the information. This kind of development is when you reveal within the story that the character character has superpowers, or that they can't read, or they're afraid of snakes and why, or they're really quiet at school but they're really loud at home, or that they were raised by their grandparents, or they used to date the antagonist's cousin, etc. This second process is what we'll be focusing on in this series. So to sum up, development reveals, it establishes different dimensions of a character, who they are, what they can do, what they want or need, and why, etc. Ultimately creating the illusion that the character is a person. Growth is a positive change to one or more of those character dimensions, shown clearly through logical progression. Development can change the audience perception of a character, once we understand more about them, we have explanation for their behavior, we may view them differently. But it is not a change of the character themselves like it is with growth or decay. Presenting character development within a story can either be done explicitly, directly told to the audience, or implicitly, by what they are shown. Say you want to reveal that your character is secretly jealous for the affections of a friend who is currently in a relationship with someone else. You could have one character say, those two are so cute together, to which the jealous character responds tightly, sure, but it'd be nice if they could take their hands off each other once in a while. Or you can show the happy couple holding hands as they enjoy a romantic stroll through the park, and describe how the jealous character 
sister's gaze follows their friend in particular, wondering to themselves what attracts that friend to their partner. The thing to keep in mind is that explicit presentation doesn't inherently mean spelled out plainly. Feel free to be clear. I hate snakes, Shock! I hate them! But don't treat your audience like they're stupid. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. Subtext is a thing. Use it. Implicit presentation also falls on a spectrum. You can be obvious with it, or you can be subtle. But avoid being vague. Going back to my earlier example, if you have the jealous character respond to the happy couple with nothing more than quiet stoicism, the audience won't know what to infer. Are they jealous or indifferent? Angry? Maybe thinking about something else? Choosing whether explicit or implicit presentation works best depends on context. What you are trying to relay, what you've already relayed, what point it is in the story, even the age of your target audience, etc. But ultimately, using both methods is ideal, layering, showing, and telling throughout the story to create a well-rounded character for the audience to appreciate. Which is to say, it's important to remember development stacks. And this can be both your friend and your enemy in writing. For example, a muttered quip against a talented singer may first appear to be a character simply being mean-spirited, but coupled with the well-used karaoke machine you later reveal is sitting in their bedroom and their interest in poetry, the audience can start to piece together that this character wants to be a singer. Their earlier criticism was born out of jealousy. Development that builds in this way is intriguing to read or watch. As a counterexample, if the character tells a friend, I've always wanted to be a singer, but the audience sees little to no indication of this interest elsewhere, then that development is going to work against you and the character's claim is going to ring hollow or perhaps even read as deception. So if your goal was to present a character that is passionate and honest about their dreams, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot. To be frank, the reality of explicit and implicit presentation is that both what a character does and does not say or do can speak volumes. So be sure that your character's development is communicating what you intend. Now, I've noticed that there are certain developments that are the foundation for a character. I call them core developments. These are things like their appearance, personality, including moral ethics, motivations, including goals, and abilities, both strengths and weaknesses be they physical, mental, magical, whatever. This defines who your character is, what drives them, and how they overcome obstacles. The writer and audience both need this information to be well executed in order to even have a character, as opposed to a plot device or a Mary Sue. Ultimately, all the other categories of development, hobbies, relationships, backstory, likes and dislikes, are really just vehicles for conveying information on one or more of those core categories. A character's relationships and the interactions, or lack thereof, can tell you more about their personality. Their backstory may inform aspects of their motivations or their abilities. Their occupation might hint at features of their appearance. But that kind of information isn't the only way to reveal your character's core. So you could write a story that doesn't include those kinds of details and still have a well-developed character. Short stories do it all the time. So those vehicle details, things like their favorite musician, their fascination with origami, their family's religious background, or the fact that they have a food allergy, are what I call extra developments. When utilized well, extra developments can add layers to your character, world, and story. So it can be worthwhile or just fun for a writer to explore such things when creating their character. But when it comes to sharing that information with the audience, whether it is worthwhile or not comes down to the impact it has on the character, their story, and or how the audience views them. Any of the details I mentioned could be meaningful or even crucial to a particular story but not every story, like the core developments. So be careful about throwing in details that don't earn their inclusion. Oh, and if you're wondering why I'm coining my own terms for discussing development, it's because whenever I try to research character development, 
Pretty much all Google gives me is results where people are talking about character growth and calling it development. Hence why I felt the creation of this video series could be helpful, but it was also a lot of work. So just humor me on the term thing or inform me if you know of proper terminology. And if you appreciate the work we put into our content, please consider feeding the algorithm with likes and comments and maybe even checking out our Patreon. Thanks. Anyway, to explain the core developments a little bit more, when it comes to a character's appearance, keep in mind that prose handles it vastly different than visual media. So the conversation about approaching it effectively does change depending on which medium you are discussing. There's an extent to where prose can get away with not describing a character's appearance much at all, using visual descriptions mainly to relay information about how they feel, either their emotions or their vibe, such as mentioning their cold eyes, their tight smile, or the way their cloak drapes around them like a bat's wings. Apart from that, the writing mainly describes how the character interacts with their outfits as opposed to describing the outfits themselves. We'll learn that they put boots on or donned a thick sweater, but otherwise the appearance of the items is left to the imagination. On the other hand, visual media necessitates detailed character design. Their face, their hair, their build, their clothes, their items, the shape of everything, the way their elements balance, etc. To explain the intricacies of both approaches is a bit too much for me to tackle in this video, but for those who want to learn more, I'll leave links in the description for a few videos and articles covering each. When it comes to developing abilities, the most common, most obvious, and best approach is to simply show the audience what the character can do by having them do it. How the character has their abilities is the next question, but it usually boils down to either being innate or learned. If it is reasonably simple to infer how the character has the skill, an explicit explanation is not necessary. For example, if your setting has abundant magic, you don't have to explain how your character was born with magical abilities. Or if your character talks about swimming in the lake by their childhood home, you don't have to clarify how they learn to swim. Or if your character serves a homemade meal out of their parents' restaurant after hours, you don't need to spell out how they learn to cook. But if the origin of their abilities is not readily obvious, a clear explanation, even a very simple brief one, is good to have. Keep in mind how good your character is at something will have an effect on what kind of explanation is necessary for how they have such abilities. If it's a weak or standard level skill, a short or implied explanation can suffice. If it's an above average or exceptional level, sometimes even exceptionally bad, a more involved or explicit explanation is likely warranted. And speaking of how well a character can do stuff, in order for your audience to really understand your character's skill level, you need to first establish a baseline to measure against. And there's a few ways to approach that. One, you can rely on the audience's own general concept of how difficult things are. For example, you can show that your character must exert a lot of energy to light a candle with their magic. Since lighting a candle in real life is a simple task, the audience can infer that your character's magic skills are weak. Two, you can utilize the reaction of other characters in order to provide insight into what is considered difficult in your setting. If your character picks up an elephant like it weighs nothing and the other characters just shrug and move on, the audience can infer that this is a pretty standard ability. Three, you can base it on relativity, comparing and contrasting the abilities of different characters within your setting. If character A beats character B in a race and character B beats your character in a race, the audience will reasonably infer that character A is faster than your character. And if there's implication that such speed was only achievable through years of training, the audience will expect that your character will also need to train hard to surpass character A's accomplishments. In each case, you're setting up a baseline, a starting point for the character themselves, as well as a broader baseline of what the average skill level is in your setting. Naturally, by answering how well a character can do something, you will also answer how poorly they do it. Which is to say, when exploring their strengths, you should also be exposing their limits and weaknesses, the things they struggle at or can't do at all, or such things as their kryptonite, to borrow the term. 
term. Maybe your character who picked up an elephant was struck by its trunk and took a long time to recover, showing that while the character is extraordinarily strong by our standards, they're not more durable. Of course, it's important that once you've established what the character can do and how well they can do it, that any changes you make to that baseline are due to a logical progression or regression of their capabilities, such as if they've been practicing more or they suffered an injury, etc., which, to be clear, needs to be shown to the audience. It's also worth noting that characters will have minor abilities and major abilities. Minor abilities are the things they can do which don't receive much narrative attention, nor do they have much, if any, effect on the story at large. For example, you might have your character cook a meal for some friends to give them something to do while they chat. But while it will implicitly develop the character's abilities, it won't significantly impact the story. Minor abilities usually remain static. They don't get better, they don't get worse. This is often because they don't get enough attention to logically explain a shift either way. Other times, it's because it's used as a character quirk, usually if their skills in an area are humorously bad. On the other hand, major abilities are the skills a character has which do receive significant narrative attention or do have meaningful effect on the story. If your character recruits an important ally by feeding them their favorite meal, or if your character is a chef in a story about a cooking competition, their ability to cook is a major ability. Major abilities are often directly connected to an ability growth arc, which is why they end up getting more narrative attention. That being said, it's not a requirement. Now for personality. Due to how vast and fluid the scope of real human personality is, this category can be one of the most difficult aspects of a character to nail down. Not to mention, I include moral ethics under personality. Because what a character believes, whether it's based in religion or personal outlook will affect how they behave, how they treat themselves, how they treat others, what they think is acceptable or unacceptable to say or do in different contexts. It all tells us a lot about who the character is, which is the essence of this category. I'm going to do my best to explain an approach that I worked out to help mentally organize a character's personality, but Forgive me if I struggle to make it clear. It starts with figuring out the core. These are the traits which define who your character is. Like if someone were to ask you to boil your character down to just three to five descriptors, what would you say? It can be difficult or seem too formulaic and flat to be that limited, but you're not stopping there. For each descriptor, there will naturally be offshooting traits and manifesting behaviors that ripple further. And where a character truly comes to life is in the complementing and contrasting of the core descriptors and their offshoots. For example, you have a character who is kind, timid, and envious. Their kindness may offshoot into generosity and manifest in them giving gifts, but their timidity will cause them to choose small, quiet gifts, things they can give secretly or without receiving much attention in return. And then their envy may influence them to withhold gifts from those who appear to be better off than themselves. They won't be actively unkind toward those people, they simply won't be generous with them. The more core descriptors a character has, the more complex they will be, as they have more traits interplaying off one another. That being said, it's wise to avoid giving characters traits that don't earn their inclusion. If I added that the timid character is also a perfectionist, but in the story I told, that trait only kept cropping up for the sake of being there instead of naturally complex complementing or contrasting the other traits, it wouldn't be making my writing more complex, just more complicated and probably clunky. On a similar note, an important thing to remember is that the core traits will be equally dominant, and thus you cannot have contradicting core traits, because logically they would just cancel each other out. So you cannot have a character who, at their core, is both greedy and generous. However, you can have a character who is greedy, obsessed with their reputation, and loyal to their family. Their greed may complement their loyalty to their family in that it will, in part, manifest as them spoiling their family with the wealth they attain through their greed, 
in a sense, being generous to them. And or their obsession with their reputation may contrast their greed in that they will put on a facade of generosity toward the public in order to look good. So there are ways in which you can get away with a character acting out of step with a dominant core trait. But it has to clearly stem from another equally dominant core trait, which means there should be defined boundaries. If the greedy character is being generous to someone who is not A, a part of their family, and or B, able to benefit their reputation, then it's contradictory development. But another way you can have a character acting out of the ordinary is to put them in overwhelming circumstances. For example, a hopeful character can temporarily lose heart after their mentor betrays them. But again, there's defined boundaries. When the turmoil caused by the betrayal has been addressed, resolved, their characteristic hope should be rekindled unless it's a decay arc. So to put it in a nutshell, a character's core personality needs to be reasonably consistent. That doesn't mean that a character always acts the same way. While the dominant traits cannot contradict, they can contrast and or complement each other through their offshoots and manifesting behaviors. Ultimately, a character's core personality is not a prison, but without boundaries to contain them, they'll just fall apart. Similar to abilities, personality is something that is mainly shown to the audience. The reality is that actions speak louder than words is a saying for a reason. So even despite what you do have characters say about themselves or each other, ultimately the audience will glean the information from watching the character's behavior, which is great if that subtext is intended. Not so great if it isn't. When it comes to discussing motivations in context of a character's core, I'm not talking about mundane things like they wanted a snack because they were hungry, or generic they did bad things because they were a bad guy. Yes, those are technically motivations, but they have no substance. However, if, for example, food was important to the hungry character because of something in their backstory, then I'm hungry can be a meaningful motivation because it stems from their characterization. Likewise, I would expect a character-based explanation for why the bad guy does specific bad things for it to have any substance. When I'm talking about motivations here, I'm looking at the meaningful internal and or external pressures that drive a character's participation in the story that's being told. Internal motivations can be positive, generosity, love, sense of duty, etc., or negative, fear, revenge, greed, etc. External motivations often appear in the form of a character's goals. They may be rooted in the need for physical safety, a desire for someone else's approval, a hunt for something, etc. Often, external motivations, goals, will be directly connected to internal motivations. The character will be chasing fame and fortune due to their greed, or they'll be striving for a promotion to better support their beloved family. Which is to say, similar to how we can extrapolate a character's moral ethics based on how we see them behave, often a character's motivations can be extrapolated from learning their goals. And as I've kind of touched on already, an important thing to keep in mind is that there is crossover between personality and motivations. A protective character might, by their nature, be motivated to rush in and defend their friends even at risk to themselves, whereas a more strategic-minded character would be motivated to retreat treat and make a plan before coming to rescue their friends. And again, similar to personality, a character's moral ethics often, if not always, have a big impact on why the character does things. Mainly they want to do what they believe is right. The fun thing to remember is that what they believe is right isn't always actually right. This is obvious for antagonists, but you can use it for protagonists as well to create conflict and an area for growth or have it be what leads to their decay. There's a bunch of other fun twists you can do with motivations, but one that I find really adds extra flavor is when characters have motivations which contradict each other. For example, there are many situations where a belief in doing what is best for others can be at odds with a natural inclination to do what is best for oneself. 
or a character driven by their loyalty to the law and their desire for justice may find themselves struggling to do their job when the law protects unjust people. There's an extent to where everyone can relate to wanting to have your cake and eat it too. So it's not inherently unbelievable when characters want outcomes that are mutually exclusive. The difficulty is developing each contradictory motivation without making it feel like the character themselves is being inconsistent. And I think the best way to approach that is to establish the motivations before introducing the fact that they conflict. Show that the character has a secret phobia of deep water, then show that they are head over heels infatuated with someone, then reveal that their special someone lives on a submarine, or show a deep friendship bloom between two characters from different ideological factions, and then start a war between those factions. The key here is utilizing the clashing motivations to create problems that the character must struggle through, internally and or externally. If the infatuated character suddenly has no qualms about diving into the ocean, then you have contradictory development, not contradictory motivations. Or if the faction allies of our two friends have nothing to say about them betraying their cause, you could have an even bigger story problem, like a Mary Gary Sue. To put it clearly, it's okay for a character to have contradicting goals, but resolving that contradiction should either be very difficult or else impossible. Ultimately, like the polarity of magnetism, motivations propel a character through a story either by pulling them toward or driving them away from something. Or both. So yeah. That's character development. As I said at the beginning, I find that differentiating it from character growth really helps open up the concept so we can dig deeper and get the most out of it. Let me know in the comments if you found this approach as helpful as I did. And if you, like me, will start referring to character growth and development as two different things. I will say it makes sense that the terms are so often used interchangeably. Development is about giving a character dimension and growth certainly adds to that aspect. And in the execution, execution of a story, the two concepts can work so closely together that the line between them often blurs, which is something that we'll touch on when we look at examples in part two. So if you're interested in catching that when it comes out, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. In the meantime, if you appreciated this video, leave us a thumbs up and share it around with your friends. Also, as I said earlier, making videos like this is a lot of work. So if you want to support our content creation, please consider becoming a patron. Massive thanks to those of you who already have. Don't forget to stay loud and proud folks, and I'll see you around.